Good morning. Good morning, Heartland family, and welcome to another Sunday service at Heartland. We're excited to be here. Super, super excited. It is a beautiful day outside. In here, you can see everybody gathering around. It is a joy to see people excited about being at That's church. That's right. That's true. That is awesome. So we're excited that you are here, and we would love to get to know who you are and where you're joining us from. So put your name in the chat below, and also tell us where you are joining us from, and say hey to somebody else in the chat, too. And if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, we're the Bledsoe's. My name is Stefana, and this is my husband, Jackie. We get the privilege to serve on the communications dream team, and it's awesome because it gives us an opportunity to meet people that are here in the church from different services all over the city. We were at breakfast this weekend and ran into um, a couple from church that we hadn't met before, or a couple of people from right, church right. that we hadn't had a chance to meet before, so we love that, and we're grateful. Um, we're also super grateful to be worshiping with you this weekend. So wherever you are joining us from, we are glad you are here, and we want you to share your link from wherever you're streaming the service from so that your sphere of influence, yeah. your audience, your platform can also hear a word from the Lord. So yeah. if you can, go ahead and share the service now. Yeah, let your people know that we're here live yeah. today. So we have, you just mentioned this, this was great, connecting with other people in the community. That is one thing I think that God has been teaching me and just kind of reinforcing over the last few weeks, maybe in a month or so, mm -hmm. is the importance of doing life with other people yeah. and doing life in community with other people that are have similar hearts and going in the same direction or right. similar interests. So we've had the opportunity to do that with breakfast. We connect with some other couples. We've seen people in our community. This is people that we love yeah. to spend time with, and it is great. And so we want to be that community as well. And one thing that I love about it is that we can share prayer requests and pray for others. Right. And that is, Harlan is a praying church, and we love praying for everyone. So we would love to pray for you as well. We have a, a, a prayer form that you can complete at heartlandchurch.com forward slash prayer. Share whatever your prayer requests are for you, for your family, for a coworker, yeah. whoever it is. We would love to pray for you. And yes. not only do we have Sunday service every week, we also have a Saturday morning prayer service every week as well. So mm -hmm. 9 a.m. Eastern, live, we would love to pray for you in real time. So if you can't make it down in person, show up online, share your prayer requests, and we'll be praying in real time. All right. Yeah. And so speaking of prayer, we got one of the most exciting times of the year coming up. 21 days of prayer is coming up next month. Can't wait. Five days, six, seven days a week, mm -hmm. Monday through Friday, 6 a.m., Saturday night. Can't wait to see you there as well. Yep. And so if you're joining, like we said, online, if you're in the area, there's still time to make it to this last service. But if you're um, online, make sure you like and subscribe so that you don't miss a single thing. Yep. We'll see you inside.
message in that song is simple but powerful the joy of the Lord gives us strength and I invite everybody in the room this morning whatever you're going through choose joy just choose joy this morning I love how the psalmist says it he says I will bless the Lord at all times Good times and bad times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. I don't know what the struggle is. I don't know what the season you're in this morning, but I encourage you to choose joy today. Amen. So we're going to continue singing to the Lord. We invite you to lift your voices and sing along with us. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So
is faithful to meet us where we're at. So rain came, wind blew. My house was built on you. So I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it through. Rain came, wind blew. My house was built on you. That's why I know that. says that in him there is no failure is anybody grateful that God keeps his promises this morning he's a promise keeper and we're grateful for that this morning and maybe you walked in this morning and you find yourself at a place in your life where you desperately need a promise of God when you find yourself in these seasons you have to grab hold onto his promises and never let go. So this morning, we're going to declare the promises of God together. Is that all right? So repeat after me, say, my God will never leave me nor forsake me. Come on, say, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. And this is the one I need you to say. Say it with your chest, they say. Come on. Say, I am a beloved child of God. Say, I am a beloved child of God. Come on, let's give God some praise this morning. Let's continue singing to Him. from the 
we thank you so much for your presence here in this room today. Some of us in this room this morning needed to hear that encouragement through song, God. And so we say thank you. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are a promise keeper. And right now, God, we open our hearts to whatever it is that you want to do in this service. Have your way in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Can we put our hands together for God, the promise keeper, the most faithful one that we know. Let's put our hands together for him this morning. And while we're clapping, can we celebrate everybody who's here for the first time, as well as those who are joining us online. We are so glad that you made it to church this morning, and we're excited uh, for the rest of this service. Can you find two or three people? Give them a high five and tell them good morning. What's up, Heartland? My name is Andrew, and I am so glad that you made it here today. Before we get into the message, I'd like to share a few things with you that we're looking forward to. First off, we know you're here for a reason today, and we're so glad we get to share this time together. We'd love to be a part of your journey, and the easiest way to get connected is to fill out a connection card. You can find one in the seat back in front of you, or by clicking the link in the chat online. If you've only been here once or twice, we'd be especially happy to answer any questions you may have, and we'd love to gift you a free devotional book written by our pastor. Just bring your connection card to the welcome desk in the lobby, or write to us at info at heartlandchurch.com to learn more. Hey students and parents, our 2024 summer trip to Kings Island is this Friday, and there's still time to sign up. It will be an awesome day for all 7th through 12th grade students and is a fantastic way to close out the summer. Then, mark your calendars for October 4th, 5th, and 6th because registration has opened for our annual student conference, The Weekend. Your student will experience three days of faith-building sessions, exciting competition, and opportunities to build close and lasting relationships in small groups. We believe this will be an incredible way to fuel their faith this fall, and we don't want anyone to miss out. So to register for the conference at our super early bird rate or to sign up for Kings Island, just text STUDENTS to 68000. We can't wait to see you soon. Heads up Harlan, it's almost time to register your small group plans for the fall. There's never a better time than now to dig deeper in your relationships and your faith. So be thinking about what kind of small group you can lead this fall. You can continue a current group or start a new one, and you'll be able to register your group next week. We will also have small group leader training sessions each week starting next Sunday. And these are also available for you if you're interested in helping lead our student small groups. If you have any questions at all, just text GROUPS to 68000. As we get ready for the fall and a new school year, we want to take time to put God first. So in just two weeks on August 4th, we will kick off 21 Days of Prayer. If you're new to Heartland or aren't familiar with 21 Days of Prayer, it's a three-week period we set aside twice a year to pray together as a church. We'll gather together every weekday from 6 to 7 a.m. and on Saturdays from 9 to 10 a.m. Text the number 21 to 68000 to find out more. We've got an amazing day ahead of us, and I hope you're ready for a word from God just for you, because today is going to be a great day. Well, good morning, everybody. So glad to see you. Welcome to Heartland. And my name is Darren. I'm the pastor here. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, but I welcome you, not in the name of any church or religion, but in the name of the God who created you in his image and who loves you and uh, who speaks over you today. So glad that you're here. Um, you are just an amazing church, and I just heard you singing today, and it just made me so happy. You know, you came and you gave it your all. How about that worship team and the choir today that just, man, they got me. So I'm glad you're here. It's going to be a great morning. Uh, we got a lot to do today, so I'm going to cut right to it. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for the way that you give. This last week, I've been able to be with many of our partners and see the work firsthand, uh, what you guys are investing in, pastors that we invest in so that their congregations can flourish. And uh, just, you have no idea, you take something that's so tangible and small, but you put it together with all of God's people and it gets multiplied into eternal blessing for people in ways you can't imagine. So it's time for the offering, everybody. Time for us to give to the Lord. And if you're new to Heartland, you don't, we don't pass an offering plate. You can you uh, can give if you'd like to, but the opportunity to do so best is to text the word GIVE to 68000 or go to the website and you can give there 
And one of the great things about doing it that way is not only will it show you how to give, but it'll show you all the places where your giving is going and the impact uh, that it's making. There's also offering boxes on your way out if you wanna go old school, but uh, I encourage you, this is just so easy to do. But one of the places where your giving goes is, is into something that's bringing about the end of chronic homelessness in Indianapolis. And years ago, a few of us faith leaders in the city got together to say, what can be done? It seems like this chronic problem doesn't go away. And it wasn't just Christian pastors, it was rabbis and it was people from other faiths and we got together. By the way, uh, you know, we said right off the bat, uh, we don't agree on a whole lot. There's lots of things we don't see eye to eye on. We have different theologies. Now that that's out of the way, what are we gonna do together to make Indianapolis a better place for our children? and to deal with some of the major chronic problems that we have. And one of the biggest problems that just was the overwhelming issue is chronic homelessness. And one of the friends that I've made along this journey for 20 years now is uh, Rabbi Aaron Spiegel. And joining him today is Dr. Joanne Lyon. And she was there the day that this group founded together. And we've walked together and we've learned a lot. But let me tell you about my friend, Rabbi Aaron. He is one of the most committed, most uh, fiery leaders for justice in our city. I've grown to love him and appreciate him, not just as a colleague, but as a really dear friend. And don't let his stature fool you. He's not afraid of anybody. He, he will speak the truth to power. He has done so much to guide us and to lead us and the, the way he's brought the research. And we believe we have an answer to chronic homelessness, but first we have to hear about the problem. But would you do me a great honor today? Would you welcome my friend and the president of the Indianapolis, the Greater Indianapolis Multi-Faith Alliance, Rabbi Aaron Spiegel. Man, that gets better every time. I want to do another service. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I hate to interrupt the joyfulness of this worship service, but we have some important work to do, and it's not easy and not nice. We have a housing crisis in Indiana, particularly in Indianapolis. This is my first slide. I want you to know I'm very proud of this graphic. I worked really hard on it. <laughs> This is the 64 largest cities in the United States. What city do you think has the most evictions? What city? Shout it out. New York. Makes sense. Largest city in the country, the most evictions. What city do you think has the second largest number of evictions in the country? Indianapolis. Indianapolis has the second largest number of evictions, total evictions, not, not per capita, in the country. Now, the caveat to that is this year that changed. The rankings haven't been updated. We've been number two since 2016. We're now number four, and it's not because things have dropped here. It's actually risen, but the rest of the country is starting to catch up. We have a national housing crisis. Indianapolis, Marion County, averages four to 600 eviction filings a week. A week. We believe, anecdotally, that there are that many, what we call soft evictions as well. Landlord says, I'm gonna raise your rent by 30%. I can't afford it, I leave. Landlord says, just get out. I don't want you there anymore. People leave. If that's the case, then we're up there with New York. Indianapolis, the 17th, 16th largest city in the country. And we have one of the worst eviction records in the country. It affects everything. Housing, secure housing, insecure housing is the number one issue affecting everything. We know it affects mental health. We know it affects physical health. There's a great study out of Cornell last year that shows a direct correlation between evictions and crime. I've said to the mayor, you wanna reduce crime in Indianapolis? 
stop evicting people. Stop putting people on the street where they have to take care of themselves. There's a study right now going on at, at IU that shows a direct correlation between infant mortality and insecure housing. It's a huge problem we have to address. The National Academy of Science had a, uh, a research project last year, and I'll let you read this. The most common age to experience eviction in the United States is childhood. The most common age to experience eviction in the United States is childhood. We say we care about kids. Well, let's start acting like it. And where does this lead? What does the evictions have to do with homelessness? It's the direct pipeline. Families are evicted. They end up homeless. A group out of Notre Dame did a research project. They called it the Scarlet E. If you have an eviction on your record in Indiana, you'll never be able to find housing. People are leaving the state. And we have these tropes about homelessness that just aren't true. It's substance abuse issues. It's mental health issues. Cities with high homelessness rates have, are in the Sunbelt states. It's absolutely wrong. The data has known this for 20 years. Cities with high rates of homelessness have low inventory of affordable housing. That's right. It really is that simple. Not easy, but it's that simple. And Indiana, our state, is one of the worst. Indianapolis is one of the worst cities in the country. We don't have enough affordable housing for people to live. We can end chronic homelessness. We can. Other cities have done it. We just need to use their, their template. In this building, a little over a year ago, Jim Mathy, the housing czar of Milwaukee County, who have essentially ended homelessness, said to us, you're so far ahead of where we were when we started this, you could do this in six months. We could. So the question is, why haven't we? The answer is, we don't have the political will to do it. We, our city leaders, our state leaders for sure, don't have the will to do the hard things, simple again, but not easy, to make this a priority. Soccer is more of a priority than ending homelessness. You say it, say it. We need to speak out, and here's something you can do. Next month, our friend Don Sawyer, he's right back there, the Indianapolis release of the movie Beyond the Bridge, A Solution to Homelessness, August 20th, Clues Hall, Butler University. We need to fill the room. Yeah. We need 2,000 people there. Everybody take out your phone, scan the QR code, and register to come. We need to show our city leaders that this is not okay. We need to show our city leaders that they don't have a choice. They have to make this a priority. If we can spend $500 million to bring an MLS team to Indianapolis, we can spend a quarter of that, a tenth of that, and end chronic homelessness. That's right. We can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my good friend, Rabbi Spiegel. And then why should we do this? Well, those of us sitting right here, people of God, the, there are over 3,000 verses in scripture that call us to take care and minister to the poor and the vulnerable. There's no other subject with that many scriptures in the whole Bible. And then we find in the Old Testament, the great text that says, love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, strength, and your neighbor as your equal. Then Jesus sums it up in the New Testament and he says, I take all the commandments together and they are summed up in this. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as your equal. That's a call to us, my friends. It's not saying, I want you to do this. It is, I want you to flourish. I want your communities to flourish as you follow this. 
And then we go to James, who really lays it on us. <laughs> and he says, you know, your faith without works is dead. I wanna see your works, then I'll believe your faith. That's for us today. And it isn't to put us, to make us feel badly. It is say, this is a joy that we can do and that God can receive the glory. And Heartland, you've been talking about this. We've been working at this. Pastor Aaron, you've been leading us in such wonderful ways in this. And I just look forward to all that God's gonna do. And Don, I want you to know that Don did this film all over the country. He slept in his truck while he was doing this. Yeah. It's a sacrifice. And this, is, this brings joy to the heart of God, Don, and I wanna thank you for that. Let me just say a quick prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you're calling us today to something that's beyond ourselves, but together you can accomplish what brings great joy and glory to you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, thank you. Will you give God praise for these two great leaders that thank you, Rabbi Aaron, for joining us, Joanne. So again, that's, August the 20th, it's a month out, it's plenty of time for you to clear your schedule so you can be there at 4.30 at Clues Hall at Butler University. And I pray that the church will just show up and join our brothers and sisters across uh, Indianapolis and we're going to make a difference that day. And again, uh, Don Sawyer, who is one of our members, put together this tremendous film, Beyond the Bridge, um, A Solution to Homelessness. And Don, I'm so proud of you. Thank you for your labor of love. Can you guys just give God praise for Don Sorry, He's back on a camera right now. <laughs> praise God for you. If Milwaukee can end chronic homelessness and Houston can do it and we follow the template, we can have this done here. Why not Indianapolis? Why not get us off that list of being the second? Who, nets, who, who wants to get Indianapolis off that list, all right? So God, we now we open up our hearts to you and we're ready for the word today. Slow us down, help us to think and to hear. Speak to us now in Jesus' name, amen. Holiness, holiness, it's what I long for. Holiness, it's what I Holiness, it's what you want from me. Hey, 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 yeah. Faithfulness, faithfulness, it's what I long for. Faithfulness, it's what I Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. We're in the 25th week of a series called Abide in Christ. Can you believe I said that? 25. But we started this series back in January. I'm walking you through the last sermon that Jesus ever spoke to his disciples. I have all the notes for you. They're available by texting the word notes to 68,000. For those of you online, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you click the subscribe button. That way you won't miss anything. And then all the messages are archived on the channel. So you could like binge watch on a whole weekend all of the sermons and catch up. 
But I started this series because people are so discouraged right now, they're so disillusioned, and they're so disappointed, and I felt this is the passage of scripture that you needed to hear. My daughter Lauren is a gifted high school teacher. She teaches people who have exceptional needs. And she's very good at her job. She has the ability to make things plain for people who sometimes struggle with learning. And she had a friend who asked her to teach her to make sourdough bread. That's another one of her skills. She's an amazing baker, takes after her mom. And her friend says, will you teach me how you do this? How do you make this sourdough bread? And the good teacher she is, she knew that she would have to show her and not just tell her what to do. Because to make sourdough bread, you can't just make sourdough bread. You have to, you have to create this thing, um, what do you call it? The thing that you... The starter, that's it, the, the starter. And it's just a terrible thing. This, this starter is so messy and it, it's gross and you have to feed it. It's like it's alive in all the wrong ways. I had some I wanted to bring to you today, but it's just so bad. It smells, you just don't want anything to do with it. And she knew that if she just brings this over to her friend's house, because you have to, to share the mess with somebody else, and once you share that mess, then they start to feed their mess, and before you know it, they'd just be discouraged and disappointed, they wouldn't do it. So the good teacher that she is, she brought over a pre-prepared loaf to put in the oven and have it baking with all the wonderful, beautiful smells so that there's a vision of what's gonna come while you're making the mess. Because the good teacher knows you have to have a vision to get you through the mess. That's why Jesus is teaching this last sermon. He's got a mess on his hands. He's got discouraged, disillusioned, disappointed, doubting followers who've been with him for three years and they were really excited at the beginning, but he didn't do what they expected. And he's talking about suffering and he's talking about death. And they heard him talk about the kingdom of God and they're like, we're taking our country back. And then when it didn't happen the way they thought because the kingdom of God is something that starts small and it starts always in messy places, but it grows and it becomes something transformational. They couldn't see it yet. And when it didn't go the way that they thought it should go, they're discouraged. This sermon is taking place in a, in a private room and he's huddling discouraged, disillusioned people together and it is a mess and they're looking for the exits, they're done. One of them has already said, I'm going over to the other side. And Peter is saying, no, no, I'm with you. And Jesus says, you're not gonna make it through the night. You're gonna deny me before the night's over. In fact, all of you guys are going to give up and abandon me. And it seems like the starter project of these disciples is just a total mess. But I want you to know that Jesus does not give up on them because it's a mess. He starts to speak to a future version of who these guys are going to be. He doesn't call them out for where they are right now. He doesn't label them by their discouragement or their depression or even their disillusionment or their doubts. He speaks to who they're going to become and not what they're doing in the present moment. And that's why I'm bringing this to you right now because God's looking at some of you. You're filled with discouragement, you're disillusioned, you're doubting, you're disappointed, you're looking around at our country, you're looking around at the world, you look at your own life, you look at your failures, and you think something's wrong. And the thing I know about discouraged people is that they have no patience with a mess. They just want it gone, and they have no vision, they can't see. And I'm trying to get you to see something. Jesus wanted these disciples to see something like when you find yourself in that state, when you're disappointed and disillusioned, Jesus says, abide in me, like stay connected to me, don't quit, remain in what I've taught you. I know it looks like a mess. I know there's gonna be failures, but stay connected. Let life from me flow into you. I am your source of power. Disconnected from me, no life flowing in you. You can do nothing. He talks to them. This is like, like, be, like be like that branch that's connected to the vine. 
If you're connected, if you abide in me, you'll produce much fruit. But, but if you're not connected, you'll produce nothing. And he begins to talk to them about, I'm going to go away. What? You're leaving? They didn't understand. They're more discouraged. And he said, you don't get it. If I go, the Holy Spirit will come. The same spirit that's in me will fill you. The same spirit that's in me, he will be your, your helper, your comforter, your counselor, your advocate, your guide, your teacher, your strengthener, your, your intercessor, your friend. I will be in you and I will never leave you, even when you fail. So I factored in the failures that I see happening right now, and I will never abandon you. I've already chosen to forgive you. I'm not keeping score. I've factored in the failures. It's part of your story because who you're becoming is far greater than what you're doing right now. Can I get an amen, somebody? So after he taught them all this, he prays for them. And while we have the Lord's Prayer in the Bible, it's just a pattern of prayer. This is the only place in the Bible where you actually have at length a recorded prayer where you get to hear how Jesus prays for his followers who are discouraged, disillusioned, and disappointed. Watch how Jesus prays now as we step into the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. Verse one, after encouraging them, Jesus looked towards heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people. You granted him authority. This is Jesus who's, who knows what's coming who's gonna stand in front of Pilate, who's going to stand there and, and be accused falsely and say to power, you wouldn't have any authority if it wasn't given to you by my Father. Jesus is so secure in who he is. You've granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. And then he explains, now this is eternal life. Listen, that you may know him, that, that they may know you, God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. He doesn't, he doesn't want them to perform. He doesn't give them a list of religious duties to accomplish. He says that eternal life is knowing God, knowing him personally. We get so distracted and we're so discouraged. Our eyes get off of who God is and onto our mistakes, and we forget that the whole point is that you know God. That's what Jesus prays for which is why we organize and we have a vision every year to help you know God in a more real way. We start the year with the 21 days of prayer and we start the school year with 21 days of prayer. We actually stop everything, we shut down and we say for 21 days all we're gonna do is know God. We're gonna come into his presence. And we do it at 6 a.m. every morning. We start the day at 6 a.m. And you'd be amazed, some of you have no idea, this place packs out more people than right now at 6 a.m. in the morning. People hungry to be in the presence of God, praying for themselves, praying for one another, getting close to God. And they're not trying to know more about God, they're just actually getting to know God in a real and personal way. And what prayer does is actually connect you to God. And the fasting part is where you are disconnecting from the world, disconnecting from the feeds. And some of you, you need to do that. You had those resolutions at the start of the year and then summer came and you went on vacation and you lost all your willpower. It's time to get back again, time to reclaim some of that discipline and say, okay, I'm cutting some things out, I'm gonna fast some things, but not just food. Maybe you'll fast other feeds like the feeds that are coming in that you live on, the social media feeds, or maybe the news feeds. Maybe you need to fast the industrial outrage complex that is pouring uh, just more hate and anger and fear into your life every single day. What if for 21 days you said, I wanna know God and I'm gonna turn down the noise on all that. Well, I heard one guy say, I'm gonna fast my hate for 21 days. I heard someone say, well, maybe I'll fast porn for 21 days, see what happens. They had no idea that that decision would change their whole lives because it starts something. It's the start of something that's messy in the beginning, but you have no idea. 21 days isn't about 21 days, it's about 365. It's about God doing something that's gonna flow into something else. 
where your life becomes beautiful. I can't explain it to you. You have to just come see it for yourself. The teenagers get this. Hundreds of teenagers will be here at 6 a.m. praying and seeking God. And, and parents, adults, it'll melt your heart to see young people go after God that way. In fact, there's actually a movement right now. There's organizing that's happening. Young, young uh, kids are rallying together and they're inviting their friends and getting them ready to come and spend 21 days of prayer together starting that first day, that first Monday morning. I think when you see hundreds of young people, it's gonna set the whole church on fire. You're gonna to start to see, see at 21 days of prayer, I mean, y'all come to church now, great, but the people who come at 6 a.m., they really wanna be there. And I'm telling you, there is an energy, there's a zeal, there's a passion, there's a, an atmosphere that I can't explain. But I'll tell you, when you experience the presence of God like this for yourself, the things you read about Jesus are gonna become real to you. I can't explain it, but I'm trying to help you catch a vision where there's no vision, people perish. If people can't see, they stumble all over themselves. Jesus was always trying to help people catch a vision. And one of my favorite stories of Jesus doing this, it's found in Luke chapter 13, where it was on the Lord's day, it was on the Sabbath day, where Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman who'd been crippled by a spirit. Notice that, it was a, a spirit, a heavy spirit, weighing her down, crushing her. 18 years, she was bent over by the weight of the discouragement and the depression and the condemnation and the oppression. She was bent over and she couldn't straighten up at all and Jesus saw her that day, saw her just as she was and he sees that woman and he calls her and then he spoke to her. He said in the condition she was in, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. He doesn't label her by her condition. He speaks to who she's going to become and then he touches her. Oh, come on, somebody. God speaks something over you even before the touch comes. Then when the touch came, immediately she straightened up and she could not believe it. Oh, I bet she praised God. She had been weighed down, crushed in her spirit for 18 years, a heaviness, and it was gone. And she straightened up. You'd think everybody would praise God, but that's not the case. One thing religion has a really hard time with is setting people free. And you would think everybody would be excited about people getting free. I found that a lot of times religion hates it when people get free. They wanna put people more under bondage. This, the synagogue leader that day was indignant. <laughs> he was upset because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Can you imagine? She's burdened down 18 years and he's focused on, you broke the rules. There's six days for work, so come and be healed on those days and not the Sabbath. And the Lord answered him. You hypocrites, not just him. He had a little tribe of religious people and Jesus said, come on, each of you, come on. You on the Sabbath day, you know you'd untie your animal, you'd untie your donkey from the stall or your ox and lead it out to give it water. You'd take care of your animals. Should not this woman notice a daughter? He calls her daughter. Doesn't call her cripple. Doesn't call her by her mess. Doesn't, doesn't name her by her condition. He just says, I saw her. I called to her, this woman bound for 18 long years. And sh should this not be the day for her to be set free? And I wanna say to you, isn't today the day for some of you to be set free from the things that are weighing you down? And when he said this, his opponents were humiliated. But the people were delighted, just like you clapped right now. They rejoiced at the wonderful things. That's what happens when Jesus enters the picture, wonderful things begin to take place and people praise God. And you'd think he'd stop there because you'd think, well, there's a nice ending of the story. But Jesus sensing the opportunity to share vision to people who can't see, he stops and he says, don't you see? Can't you see the vision? The kingdom of God, you know what it's like? What shall I compare it to? It's like the tiniest of seeds, a little mustard seed, which a man took and put in his garden. But that little starter thing turned into something so great and so beautiful and provided a blessing for everything, even the birds and the branches. That's what the kingdom of God does. It takes something very small, starts off little, 
just a word spoken, just a little bit of faith, and it grows into something beautiful and wonderful that will be a blessing to others. And Jesus says, but wait, there's more. Let me share more vision with you. You know what it's like? It's what's like compared to the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast, something terrible and gross and messy that a woman took and she mixed it into about 60 pounds of the flour until it worked its way all through the dough. That's what God does. He delights in taking little things that are so small and messy today, but he'll work it all through. And in the end, he's gonna work it out and make something beautiful out of what was once a mess. Come on, somebody. That's the kingdom of God. And he sees you where you are today. This woman crippled. 18 years, weighed down, bent over. And I ask you the question today, what has you bent over? What's making you not stand up straight? What's crippled your confidence? What's got you so discouraged, so disillusioned, so disappointed, so heavy hearted? And I just wanna remind you that Jesus doesn't call her for her condition, doesn't call her by what she looks like, doesn't label her. He sees her already as whole. He sees what she's going to become while she's still bent over and he calls her daughter. That's incredible. He calls her daughter. That's not the voice that you hear in your head. You have a voice of condemnation that screams at you all the time that tells you what you're not and what a mess you are and how disgusting you are. The voices we hear mostly sound like, well, God's not pleased. You're breaking my rules. Go, guess what? Jesus broke the rules and religion was indignant. Jesus broke the rules and religion was mad. Six days for work, come be healed on those days. God's not pleased when God was in the middle of doing something beautiful. It was just, it was a mess, but he was doing something beautiful. And the hypocrites, just love to weigh people who are burdened down with even more rules and more condemnation. And if you, if you wanna get out, well, you better do this. Crippling them, a crippling spirit. Do you know that there are, there are things that have crippled you that aren't even your fault? Do you know that there's, yeah, there's sins that we do, but there's the sins that are done to us that religion barely has a category for. And some of you are living today that the self that you are today was informed and created by traumas and different things done. And and it's it's gripped your life under a weight that you can't explain to people, but it's there and you're burdened down all the time. And then religion comes along and just tells you, stop it and God is not, not, not pleased with you and he's mad at you. And I'm telling you, that's a lying spirit. It's a crippling spirit. How many of you grew up in church where the worship leader said, and you accepted it, the worship leader said, God is good all the time. And you said back, and all the time, God is good. Everybody clapped. And then the worship leader sat down and the preacher got up and he said, God is mad all the time. (laughs) And all the time, God is mad. Come on, you heard that sermon, I wasn't the only one. You've grown up around that. That's basically what a lot of church is. And pastors are no exception. I was talking to some pastors this week. They were sitting around a table at this retreat that your generosity provided to help pastors who are so discouraged and disillusioned and disappointed to thinking about giving up. And I sat there with these pastors to pour into them and I just listened to their stories. And this one pastor, I'll never forget, he, he said, I think, I think my heart is so hard and God is not pleased. The pain that I've been through has made me so hard and my attitude's not right. And, and I just think that if I could just, you know, I, I know that God wants me to clean it up and, and get it right. Almost like, like I gotta clean up my act and then God will bless me again. And he was so hard on himself. So I went to him later and I got him aside and I said, hey, I think I heard you say that God's pretty upset with you. Are you sure that's God talking to you? because that's not the tone of a loving father. I want you to know I love you and God loves you. You're a great pastor. I want you to be kind and compassionate to yourself today because you are the beloved son of God. And I watched tears roll down his face. It, nothing changed but a word spoken. Just one word spoken. The touch is gonna come, but a word spoken began to lift a broken, a man I saw weighed down and broken down. 
and God began to lift him. I'm telling you, I'm glad that God will speak to you even before the touch will come. Come on, somebody, claim that today, that God is speaking a word into your life. So I made it home from the retreat. My flight was not delayed. I'm the one guy that made it home this weekend. I thought for sure I'm gonna be stuck in some airport. And I got home on record time. It's the favor of God on your pastor. I can't explain it, but I'm here. And I got home late uh, Friday night and then Saturday morning, I get up like I always do and I came over here and I walked the way of the cross, which is so beautiful right now. And you just are, I'm so touched by it and it was early and I was waiting for the sun to come up. And when, I, when the light began to come up, I noticed there were two young teenagers, two young boys from our church, one by the name of Danny, and they were sitting there on the path and they were with their Bibles open and they were waiting for the sun to rise. And I was just so struck by that. And I remember, you know, Danny's life has been hard. Danny lost his mom to cancer a few years ago. And so, you know, a young man growing up and you can't understand why has God taken my mother. She was a great godly woman, part of one of the founding members of our church. But God has really done an amazing thing in Danny's life. And here he was and he'd called his friend and said, meet me here, let's wait for the sun to come up and let's encourage one another. And I just stood at a distance and I thought, man, this kid is so amazing. I love him so much. I'm so proud of him. His mom is looking down from heaven, just pleased at her son, you know? So by the time I made it around, the one friend had left, but I sat down with Danny for a minute. I said, hey, what are you reading today? And he says, I'm reading from the book of Hebrews. I said, well, what are you, what are you reading? Show me. And here's the verse that he was reading in his Bible. It said, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. I said, well, what do you think that means? What does that say to you? And he says, well, I mean, we're just here to encourage each other, I guess, to make sure that we don't, you know, we don't want sin. We don't want to, you know, do bad things. We want to, you know, get our hearts right. And we want to encourage one another so that we don't get sucked away by sin's deceitfulness. And I was sitting there listening to how he was saying it. And I said, can I show you a different way to read this? I think when we see the word sin, we just think of the long list of stuff that basically says to us, you need to stop doing that. You need to get right. You need to, you need to quit. Stop it. One of the enemy's greatest temptations in your life is to convince you that you are not the beloved son of God, that there's something wrong with you. And so he comes to people in the very first story in the Bible, in the garden, he says to people whom God has entrusted with all authority. And he says, if God really loved you, he wouldn't hold out on to you. Why don't you take that power he's given you and use it for your own gratification? Use it for yourself. He comes to Jesus in a tempting sort of way and he says, if you're the son of God, we'll prove it. Do something, make it happen. Take matters into your own hands because you know God's not gonna take care of you. Do something. Or if you're the son of God, why don't, you, why don't you do something spectacular so everybody will say how amazing you are? Because you don't even know who your father is. Or if you're the son of God, why don't you just bow down to me now and get it over with? I'll give you everything. And the lie that people are swimming in all the time is you're not the beloved son of God. You're just what you do. You're what other people say. You're what you have. I see a whole uh, community around here driven by this. And they're discouraged and they're disappointed because they don't feel like they're doing enough or they're doing the wrong things or maybe enough people aren't saying nice things about them or they don't feel like I'm making any kind of a difference and nobody notices me or maybe they just feel like I, I don't have what I need to be happy. And so they're just struggling in this weight and it's, it's crushing them. Some of them don't even trust God anymore, like years they did, but 18 years later, they're just abandoned God because I don't, he hasn't done what I want him to do or I don't have what I'm supposed to have. And, I, and, and that's what the deceitfulness of sin is to get you to doubt that you are the beloved son or daughter of your father. And I just said, Danny, do you know how much God loves you today? I think you're so amazing for sitting here. I think you're an amazing young man. He's one of the future leaders in our church, I'll tell you that right now. And I told him how his mom would be watching him from heaven today. So proud of this young man. Up early, before the sun rises, to seek God. Don't let anything convince you that you're not the beloved son of God ever in your life. I wanna say that to you. You are 
today. I speak this word over you. You are the beloved daughter. You are the beloved son of God in whom I'm well pleased, God says. And the lie screams back at me right now and says, but you don't understand, I'm a mess. My life's a mess. That's a spirit that's crippling you. You've got a wrong view of God. You're living under a burden of trying to get God's approval and everybody else's approval. Got to get yourself right, be right. And some people have been flattened under this for so long. And I want you to accept this word. Jesus saw and then he calls and then he speaks. And then the touch comes. But I want you to grab hold of this word today that you are the beloved daughter. You're the beloved son of God. And that lying spirit will say, oh no, but you got too much sin in your life. Well, kind of reminds you what the apostle Paul said. He said that, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were perfect, no, no, while we were messed up, when we were in that starter stage, when we were gross, when we were disgusting, when we were sinners, that's when Christ said, you need me now. And he died for us. He predecided to forgive you. He already loves you. I want you to believe the gospel today that you already are the beloved son or daughter of God. He saw you in your mother's womb. He loved you with an everlasting love. That means he's loved you from eternity past. He'll love you through this life and he'll love you into eternity forever. And I know this. I know this because I had to believe what God said about me. There's still many areas in my life where I'm still bent over where my confidence is still crippled. But Jesus is speaking to me while I'm still in my present condition. He's calling me whole before I am. He sees who you're gonna become. He sees you today in spite of the mess and he declares a vision of who you're going to be. I need you to believe that today. This is the Lord's day. I declare that you are a precious daughter, a precious son, yes, bent over, yes, burdened, yes, heavy hearted, but you're about to be set free. And I speak that word in Jesus' name, who sees you and calls you before he touches you. And it's gonna start small, imperceptible, a little tiny seed, but your life is gonna be a blessing to so many. And even if it's messy right now, it's gonna work its way all through your life. The love of God is gonna affect every part of your life. And I declare deliverance, healing, restoration, he will redeem. That means he'll take care of every mistake you've made and he'll work it out for your good. Do you receive this word today? <laughs> well, then let's just receive it. Close your eyes. Let's pray together. Kind of stick your hands out in your lap just to receive it. God, I know that I need you. Pray that prayer with me. I need you, God. I believe you, I believe that you speak this word over me, that I'm your beloved son. If you believe that today, tell God you believe him. I believe, I'm your daughter, I'm your son. God, I'm sorry for living without you. I'm sorry for doubting you. I'm sorry for holding you at a distance. Please forgive me, I'm sorry. God, you love humble people. Thank you for the person praying this humble prayer, forgive me. Now say this last part of the prayer. God, I give you my life. Put my life in your hands. Mold me and make me and, and work your love into every part of my life. Do something in me that I cannot do for myself. I give you my life to work on. I'm gonna trust you. Lord God, I pray that you would do something beautiful. Whatever mess is today, I pray you'll start something that's so beautiful that a year from now, they won't even recognize themselves. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, receive that today, every one of you. I know there was somebody who prayed that prayer with me today. Maybe you're believing in God for the very first time. Maybe you believed a long time ago, but today's the day you said, I'm coming back. And uh, I wanna help you. I wanna start a conversation with you. I, wanna, I want you to grow. And if you'll text the letter B, which just means I believe. It's just, you don't have to text the whole word, just, check, just text the word B to 68,000. I will send you right back a little link that says, uh, it's, it's a book that you can have on your phone and it's called Begin, How to Have a Real Relationship with God. And I want you just to start reading. I want you to start listening, start trusting. 
a, a vision of who God says you are that's very different from the way of religion. And I want you to keep coming back. I want you to come and take my word for it. Come, come to the 21 days of prayer and just sit here and just see for yourself if you don't sense what God wants to do. You don't have to do one thing other than put yourself in the place where God's presence is. I wanna help you get to know God. And if you do that, I promise you, if you go all in, you won't recognize yourself a year from now, all right? So I love you guys. Thanks for coming today. See you next time. Keep coming back. God bless you.